Today is starting off our uh, next unit on food insecurity. Don't worry, this assessment is not going to be graded for correctness. This is going to be a way for us at the end of the semester to just really be able to gauge what do you feel like you learned through this unit. And so we'll go through some of the things today. But what I do want to focus on first, though, is how y'all responded to this question up here. So we're going to use nominal technique just like we've used in the past. We're going to go around in a circle. You're going to give one of your ideas. You don't have to explain it. Just give it. Susie is going to be our scribe. Get it down on the board. And then we'll just keep circling around until everybody's out of ideas. And then we will ask for clarification, have some discussion, and then vote. All right? And so today, anybody want to volunteer to start? Take it away. I love but, volunteers. I mean, you might want to throw this out. Other expenses outweigh importance of food for them. I want to go first. <laughs> Other expenses outweigh importance of food. Or you can just say other expenses are more important. Yeah, that might be a way to shorten it. And again, since we've got the recording device in the center, let's make sure we talk up so that people watching can listen in. Right? Which way are we going to go? Clockwise ways or count? I just put uh, growing up in poverty. People might have to go to like the food pantry or like the Salvation Army and get like their food boxes. So that's a way to solve. Mm -hmm. So food pantries. Kind of going off the stigma, I said normalize people needing help and being okay with helping them. They 
may not have access to nutritious food. Oh, no access. This is also long, and I'm sorry. It says like access to like healthcare for like birth control, so they have like too many kids or something. Oh, yeah. Kind of goes along with not being able to work, but just like disabilities. I think we've got something similar up there. I guess you could put income. We've talked about poverty, but poverty is not just income. Income specific. I don't know how you're going to write this, so maybe it'll make sense when we come out of my mouth. Um, people, like, people getting like child support and not spending it on the child. So I guess I don't know if that goes like with the financial literacy. Um, or, I guess, um, be more excited. No, that's not what I wanted to say, sorry. Um, so, like, more things could be more important in the house. So, like, a baby formula could be more important than, like, fruit and vegetables for, like, the other kids. They're choices. More. I would just say choices. choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Are we moving over to the solution? Not wasting as much food or throwing it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, storage and stuff. Like limiting waste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
consciousness to implement the continued implementation of government funded programs. Government programs. I have a really unrealistic solution, but it would be a global foundation that is supported from all the top countries who could afford it, and they develop methods of getting hungry food for all food. Oh, a global food bank. Well, what are you going to be doing in 10 years? <laughs> I like high in the sky ideas, so you should always go for them. Teaching people how to raise their own food, raise their agricultural education. I don't know if this would ever work, but like chain restaurants, like, or anyone who's willing to participate, like pair with like a food pantry or like a food bank and allow for like once a month, like those leftovers or things that are gonna be thrown out to like go to other people rather than just be thrown out, like pick them up and then pass them out. I don't know if that would so like connect restaurants and food pantries, mm -hmm. like restaurant donations. Mm -hmm. Finding ways to cut costs and make food more affordable. Mm -hmm. Affordability. Susie's writing that last one. Then. <laughs> what are some of the suggestions that y'all need clarification on? Can't read one this one.
there's two for me that kind of go hand in hand. The idea of normalizing, getting, receiving help, and then don't want help. Um, what were y'all thinking as you relate that to why people are food insecure? I, when I did like the normalizing one, like I thought of a like, really small town, and so like people get very insecure, like pulling it out, like pulling out food stamps, or like a wood car, like EBT at a two like lane grocery store. When in reality, like that's not like it is what it is. Like you need those, like you need that necessity. And so I think if people were more accepting and more open minded about it, then we'd have less people hungry all the time. I put do not want help because it kind of goes hand in hand with small town. Uh, I help at the food pantry in our town every like Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we have like high-end families that come in that like are known as like the big wigs around town that have all this money and they don't they just put their money in other places and their kids are like super skinny and you're and they're always like oh it's because of basketball it's all, and it's strictly because their kids aren't eating as much as they should and it's because they'd rather pull out their money than people know and so they'll go in and get all this food and we're like oh you're stealing from the people who need it when then ultimately they need it I heard something interesting the other day that I'm talking about that, and I've never thought about it from this perspective. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things that are correlated, like bad access to healthcare or socioeconomic status, poverty, all these different things like tend to be correlated. They like compound on each other. And I was talking about why sometimes those groups won't get help or don't like to receive help. And it's a lot of times because of the help they've been told in the past, mm -hmm. things that would help them by close family members, things like that isn't actually help. It's oftentimes abusive. Mm -hmm. And so they don't trust people who offer help. I don't know. I never thought about that before. It was kind of sad to think about. I think a lot of it also comes to like pride, kind of like what we were saying. Like we have families like that that like want the brand new boats and the brand new cars and their kids have brand new cars, but they're in substantial amounts of debts and they have nothing on their shelves. What else would y'all like clarity on? Or would just like to discuss? education um I was kind of saying the first thing I thought about was education on all these things that you asked about on this first page like food banks and food pantries and soup kitchens and all of those things because I'm sure there's some people out there that are food insecure but they don't know about those things even though it seems like um like I've all I've seen all of those words before and like kind of have an idea right what they are but I'm sure there's people that don't know and then also education like um people who don't have access to like or I need to think to put my thoughts into better ways for them I think I have something I can go off of yours, Stephanie. Um, when I said that like job insecurity and food insecurity go hand in hand, I think it's partially like some people don't, like not that you necessarily need an education to get a better paying job, but in our world it's, it's a lot easier to get a better paying job if you have an education. Um, and so like people don't have that access to an education, so in turn they don't have access to a secure job that's gonna pay enough to pay the bills and buy food and keep the lights on kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's into the conversation of a, what should minimum wage be? Like, mm -hmm. are people even being paid enough? If they can't afford food, a basic need, are they being paid enough? That's interesting, yeah. Um, I put community programs because this is actually like what we're what we've been doing in Burlington and I really feel like it needs to be implemented in more places. So our Lions Club and uh, 4 
our age groups and everything, they'll have different soup suppers. And then we'll have sometimes like block parties that people can come to for fun. And like people will donate to it, but the people who need money, we make sure that they'll go home with extra food for the week. And like jars of ham and beans and different soups and chips and everything. And then Wednesdays, we started having an after school program. And first they weren't having food and my mom was very mad about it. And so they started having food for all the kids and the kids who absolutely needed it, again, they would take all their food home. And then we have chicken fried steak Tuesdays at BNR's restaurant. And she could see that if she had any leftover, she would find the kids in town who needed it or the families and different people would donate money for it and take it to those people. And you can see how much better they perform in school, how much better the people work. And I think just community like bonding together for the common goal. It's definitely helped our area a lot. I don't know if this makes any sense, but I think like educating kids, like like those kids that like do need, because like I worked on our after school program, and like there are kids that do need food after, but like people turn a blind eye because they can't do they can't do anything. And so I don't know if like financial literacy or like food literacy is not the correct verbiage but just like kids understanding like nutrition which I know like that tries to get implemented but I don't know like, I think that could help like kids just knowing what's going on right like knowing that they need that and like I don't know if I'm saying it's making any sense um, but I think educating kids so that like they can take that and grow with that rather than just like their parents telling them they only eat a pack of ramen a day I mean, if you grow up only eating veggie straws and you think that's getting your vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody really like veggie straws? Yes. Oh, I know. But I like real vegetables too. Yeah. I prefer real vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know y'all's thoughts on government programs and what specifically about that. Um, I think like yeah, they have a lot like we said with the food stamps. Like I think there is like things that need to be changed with them, but I feel like without like the government programs like food stamps or even WIC, like a lot of people would be suffering. So I think like I guess it's kinda like towards like not the betterment problem, but some things changing around. So like implementing more or going through the ones we have and actually like going through the criteria. Yeah, because like at the one day group that I worked out, we had a lot of like families that needed help, and a lot of them couldn't even. I mean, they should have qualified. Like, you know, their financial situation, they should have qualified. And like, I was doing reading on it, and there's a video where like a person comes in and like asks the governor like all these questions, and the governor is like, "Why do you need to ask all these questions?" And they're like questions that you shouldn't even. They shouldn't even need to know for you to get financial help for food. And he was like, well, this is what it's for. And he's like, well, you still don't need that information to figure out if I qualify or not. But like, in all reality, that's what they have to go through. And I don't know, I just, it kind of bugs me, the whole food stamp thing. It sets up room for a lot of bias. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, but like, people won't like move up job-wise, you know, because like, I also worked at a daycare, but like seeing the kids come through, like some of their parents wouldn't take better jobs because childcare is so expensive. So they'd stay with the lower paid job, even though, you know, they're only getting barely any raise, you know what I'm saying? So. And they don't have to pay for child If they stay in a lower paying job, yeah. most of the time they don't even have to pay for childcare. Yeah, yeah. so that's one less expense, but, right. And you think about it, you, like in your head, you kind of want the big issue is that a lot of times that raise or that job increase doesn't cover then the cost that they're going to have. And so it's not balancing out for them. Yeah. That happens with a lot of things. With taxes, a lot of times people don't take, and this really does happen, they don't take raises because it puts them into a different tax bracket where they actually will have less take home money because of that particular raise. But what about like foster kids? Like, I know like there's some great foster homes, like because I know like my family we foster, 
but there are some foster homes that don't do what they're supposed to be doing, and I think that they just get the kids, you know, just for some of the benefits, and it doesn't really go back towards the kids, so. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of goes back to financial literacy, but I was saying financial literacy because I'm like 45 minutes from Louisville, Kentucky, and we have a park called the West End, and I've been down there, and you can definitely tell, and I mean, I've talked to them and stuff, they will take the money that's given for like child support and stuff like that, and the moms will go get manicures, their hair done, you know, like, just for themselves, but yet the kids have like nothing to eat, they're in like torn up clothes, like, but mom's over there looking like a whole new lady, you know what I'm saying? So I just, that is something that's been studied a lot that we do have to be careful about like not throwing judgments at it, but it is um, something that's common across and it doesn't matter ethnicity or any, or even location. Oftentimes the lower SES status that someone is, the more, um, I don't call it frivolous spending, but luxury spending behavior, those people tend to show. Why do you think that may happen? Probably they don't look for They've never been able to do it When you don't save, when you don't even have the ability because of an income to save, what's the other option? You save or you spend. So it becomes a habit. Yeah, that's a big issue, like, at home for me also. Like, my hometown is 42% food insecure, so, like, almost one in two children don't know where the next meal's coming from. But their parents, like, have their hair done, have their nails done, have a brand new purse, drive a nice car, like, but the kids are starving. It's very much a psychological yeah. thing. Of and when they keep it, it's that kids. scarcity. <laughs> I'm sorry, they yes. keep on having kids. They call it scarcity mindset. When you don't, when you live in a situation where you don't ever think you're going to have enough, you go and you usually spend more than what you have. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that happens. But I do have to say, the government also feeds into that some, because I know like Kentucky, on their food stamps, you can go get a manicure and pedicure on yeah, your that's, stamp money. That's how it is at home. So I just, I'm mean, kind of like, why can you do that? Somebody should be going to food. Well, so that ties into the point up there about choices. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I think some of the reading we'll do this month will tie into this of, do any of y'all want your choices taken away from you? So then why do we, sometimes how we approach things like food stamps or things like that, we want to limit choices. So if money is given for a specific reason? I mean, if you think about it in the sense of like a grant for an organization, you can't just spend that on whatever you want. You know what I mean? Like, like my during my internship, they were working on a grant to start like a like a farmers market in the area because it's in that. I think we watched a video in here about the gr the place in Oklahoma City that doesn't have like any grocery stores. That's the same zip code that the extension office is in, and so like they wanted to partner and like get a grant for a, yeah, what's it called? <laughs> um, yeah, for like a grocery store or something along those lines. Uh -huh. But like, obviously if you're getting a grant, then it has to be used specifically for that. And I feel like that's essentially what food stamps are. Like they're, the government is granting you money yeah. to buy food. Like food stamps. <laughs> yeah. So are we treating people like businesses and organizations? I mean, I guess so. <laughs> I'm just, again, these yeah, are things we're yeah. going to think through this month. But I think, like, so we're helping you out financially in the food spot, and more likely, if you are getting food stamps, a lot of people are on free health care, like, either don't have health care or free health care. So if you really want to go get your nails done, then you're saving the money elsewhere from using the food stamps and stuff like that. So kind of back to like watching how you spend your money. You can go spend it to go get your nails done because you are putting the money, the correct money to the food stamps. If we start telling people what to do with money, even if it is money they receive somewhere else, is that democratic? No. 
is that freedom that we say we value in our country? Why do you say yes? Because it's money they didn't receive from the government. The, the government has money that they give you for a certain purpose, but if you receive money from somewhere else, then you lose that for whatever you Are there other, other than food stamps, are there other entities that receive government funding a lot? Do you mean like disability checks? Or? That. What about subsidies in agriculture? When farmers receive subsidies checks, do they get told what to do with it? I mean, one thing, I, I'm just trying to help us think through, we have to be careful that if we say something, like we've got to kind of apply it to all situations that are similar. And just for some reason, food stamps and government assistance programs can be one of those that depending on whether you're a beneficiary of it or not, What's we can subsidy? tend to throw some moral judgment into it sometimes. What's a subsidies check? So in particular commodities, to produce that commodity oftentimes isn't profitable. And so our government will actually pay farmers to grow those crops and essentially provide them a profit for it even though they wouldn't receive it if they just sold it on their own. But isn't that like money, like? I guess you're not being told to grow it, but like it's going to that because it's like a need. Do so you know that it's going to that? Well, I'm saying like, okay, so theoretically people that are using food stamps and like any other kind of um, assistance, like you would hope that it's going to their family and their kids, not to the manicures and pedicures <laughs> or the alcohol. So I mean, at some point or another, we're just on like the buddy system. Like we just, we're hoping for the best, so. I think these are just some things that I think as we kind of learn about it this week, I want that to be kind of some information that y'all pay attention to as we get. Because I do think there can be, there's just a lot of different, I don't want to say misconceptions, just conceptions in general about this, whether you've had personal experience with these programs or not. Um, I think the other thing too is we've got to think about a lot of this systematically, right? It's just not a matter of whether we should give people money or not. Why are we having to give people money? So maybe that's a question to go off here too. Why do we have to, why are we having to give people money if they're insecure? Some people would, some people have or are using the government to like, they don't want to work, so they're going to use all the government help that they can. Some people, you see what I'm saying? Some I'm people would rather live very minimally yes. than have to Get apply them. themselves, which yeah. that sounds really bad, and I don't mean to step on anyone's toes, but like, I think that's how it is. Like Some people would rather not apply themselves and still get to like live minimally and they somewhat comfortably. They can get their manicures, they can get their pedicures and not have to go with the finger to do it. Just, can people get food stamps without having a job? Yes. No. That's a no. Technically, no. Right? That's a no. That's a no. But I have a, I mean, I guess this is like disability, but like he's paralyzed from the neck down and gets food stamps and does not have a job. So I don't know. Well, and that's maybe definitely that's a different situation. Yeah, but like, I think there's just so many loopholes, and like that's why some of us didn't know the answer to that question because like we do know certain people that don't have jobs but qualify for like some sort of disability, so therefore they still get them. So can't you be on WIC and not have a job? For a certain amount of time. It's like 30 days or 90 and days. And only for a certain age of the child. Okay. Mm -hmm. One thing I'm interested that I don't see up there a whole lot, I see a few things referencing, but like as far as addressing the question of why are people food insecure and how do we stop the problem, there's very few things that connect back to agriculture. There's a little talk of food waste or post-harvest loss. Um, there's things about increasing production or ag education, but do y'all think at any point, and again, the systematic approach to the issue, is there any part of it that agriculture may have to play in why people may be food insecure or how ag can help solve the problem in a realistic way? 
I mean, I feel like going along with the food waste, the only reason there's food waste is because we don't have proper food, food distribution practices. So if there was another way to somehow preserve the foods that aren't getting distributed in time, or I feel like there's probably, you know, like an average amount of every crop that a farmer sends out that's gonna go to waste anyways. So why doesn't, you know, like, like say 5% of a crop doesn't get sold, like, okay, hold half of that and give it to people that need it. You know what I mean? Because then you still have that buffer zone, but how likely is it that your crop is going to somehow sell 100%, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But who does that fall on to like pay for to like make sure like all of those, like the regulations and safety measures are being met, like Farmers and ranchers, like they can produce and produce, but at some point, someone else is going to have to like take the reins and pay for everything else. No, Vegas does something like that. I do know that. Where like a lot of these buffets and stuff now, they'll either like individually package and stuff like that. So at the end of the night, because there is so much food waste per se, they'll donate it, and whatever can't be donated. They take it to the pig farm right outside of Las Vegas, and it gets fed to the pigs. And I forget, but I think the pigs end up feeding the food pantries in Las Vegas. Like it is a very yeah. well done system. I meant more so just like fresh fruits and vegetables kind of thing, because like if you think about it, like the shelf life isn't that long, but there's got to be a way to still distribute it. And like you're saying, like not. I'm not paying. making the fruits and vegetables. Okay, I was yeah. saying like. In the sense of not paying for it, like it's not getting paid for anyways because it's getting thrown away. How much do y'all think we waste? Of the food that we grow in the United States, how much is wasted? I mean, it's 20 to 25 percent. Yeah, I was going to say like a third, maybe. It, it's a substantial amount of food waste. So like in that sense, like if 10 percent of that food is given straight out the bat, like it's going to be wasted anyways which it's not being wasted if it's being given, but like, you know what I mean? Like, the loss is still going to happen, so why not let it be a loss for you for the game first? Or why doesn't, like, grocery stores, knowing that that food is almost to that waste point, why doesn't it go ahead and, like, get in contact with the pantry or a uh, soup kitchen where they can be cooked either that few days and be used so it doesn't go to waste? They also, like, but, like, like that Walmart, for example, you can only put so much out on the shelf, like, mm -hmm. or else the like the employees get in trouble, like if you put way too much out, and so they have all this like like meat or like produce sitting in the back, just sitting there, and then like it just goes to waste because it goes out of date or something. But you get in trouble if you put too much out, and so then they just donate it for dog food. But that's what I'm saying. They know that date, like all the meat is coming up, so why don't we just call the food pantry? That's fresh meat or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's always the chance they can sell it tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? That well, makes like, some money. Uh, like we literally call our grocery store Dirty Diamonds. Like it's dirty, and like <laughs> they leave the produce out there till the very last minute because like they need that money. Yeah. And so like, I don't, I don't know how small towns like would go to like. I think it would have to be like. Dallas like and Austin and, and San Antonio, yeah. like Vegas, like that's a great operation, but like I don't know how feasible it is for like rural America, like kind of what we're talking about. Think back to theory class when we did the peanut butter dump case, right? And we talked about ethical concerns. Jars that appeared to be oily, peanut butter jars, and they just dumped it instead of giving it to a food pantry. What was the main reason that occurred? Why did Costco dump the peanut butter? Liability, yeah. food safety laws, right? Like nobody wants that litigation. One person gets food poisoning accidentally. And, you know, should we, again, we've got to think about, we have this tendency too to always want to give leftovers to people in need. But again, what's their dignity as a human being? They're leftovers. Huh? Like they are the leftovers basically. It, it's telling them they're the leftovers to society. Right? Um, and so there's some sense, you know, if you wouldn't feed it to your family, is it right to feed it to someone in need? And so we start running into some of those ethical conversations as well. But how do we go about, like, fixing that for people that don't want the help? Like, I think the reason that, like, sometimes people have, like, a negative connotation, like, with all of this is because, like, 
we do hear people just like spending it and not spending it in the right places or which it's not our place to judge by any means but like how do we help someone that doesn't want to be helped and is just continuously doing this so imagine imagine you're a single parent with three kids at home and you have to work two jobs to kind of keep the basics to pay your rent keep stuff on the table you go to the grocery store, what type of food are you going to buy when you have three kids and you're working two jobs, sometimes three jobs, that's on the weekend. Microwave, Microwave dinners, quick things. You don't even have the time at home to spend on that type of food to prepare because it does take time to prepare. So there's a lot of factors playing into that. And so, again, it can be really easy to look at, okay, how are they choosing to spend this money that they do have, but we don't know the whole backstory behind any of it either. I can tell you how my family eats the weeks Chad's here versus the weeks he's traveling. I'm very different for this mama. <laughs> very different. I'm looking for like a crock pot meal that's gonna last all week so I don't have to cook every night. I'm looking for easy already like pre it just and I know I know what healthy food is, right? I could say I'm a person that's educated on that. But it, it kind of the trade off decisions that we have to make sometimes, right? I used to work at Walmart and I would see, like so I worked in the grocery pickup, and people that were on food stamps would be ordering food that's like not that, they're like the complete opposite, where they're buying steaks and like lobster and like all this stuff mm -hmm. on their food stamps instead of buying canned goods that are gonna last a bit longer and food more. Does that come hand in hand with like Financial, yeah, financial literacy. Yeah. So they also you can also buy seeds now. Mm -hmm. Um, so they know you can buy like gardening yep. yeah. stuff to help, but they yeah, don't want to do that. But it's there's no way for the government to control what people are buying when and like if they're if they're using them the right way. Well, they've got like food stamps can be used at a lot of convenience stores now. Yeah. And so you'll just see families go in and get candy and milkshakes and pop and I'll be up there for 15, 20 minutes and leave. The reason why they're available to use is we have a lot of food deserts. And so the only place that people have to go oftentimes within a 20 minute drive is a convenience store mm -hmm. rather than a grocery store. And again, it boils back to that it's a fine line when we say what we value in our country of limiting people's choice or not. Like, yeah. what makes us human? What gives us freedom? What is democracy? And do we start going down that path of telling people what to do with their choices? Because if you start doing it in one area, it's gonna start being implemented in other areas as well. So it might not affect, and I say affect us, those who maybe aren't in those situations currently, but it could start trickling down. I mean, that's something to just, that's kind of one of those things. It is, especially if you, and it's not something we've experienced before. Stephanie, you had your hand raised. Well, okay. I was thinking about that question. You said, can farmers give food to the needy and escape the liability for food and And I thought maybe if they, somebody came up with some kind of contract because I know that like this isn't the same but one time me and my dad were in a grocery store and a windstorm and the power went out for like two seconds and as soon as the power came back on all of the workers started taking meat off the shelves and we were literally there to buy steaks because our power was out we needed to grow something and they wouldn't let us buy it and my dad's like no for real like I don't care you know I'm not going to sue you or whatever. I think personally, if, I, if um, I could get food from a farmer, I would for sure sign something to say that I'm not going to, I can't sue you or whatever. This food hurts me or something because I want it, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm Did sure there are people that would want food like that that's either more affordable or just would be wasted anyways. Yeah. Didn't they sign something like that during COVID with a couple of these farmers? Some places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we'll talk a lot about supply chain in November, 
<laughs> to really get on that. But it'll be, it, it's important that we focus on food and security now because it's such a huge part of what we'll talk about with kind of the logistics and supply chain and how do we get around some, again, like what are things that are hindering us from being able to provide and distribute this food and then what are some opportunities for us to go down that road. Um, I'm not going to have y'all today like vote because I don't know, again, this is a very complex problem, very complex, and I just don't think with the amount of information that we have today, we can choose a solution or choose what are the top issues. I think that's something we'll have to come back to at the end of the month. I do want to flip over to the pre-assessment though and just kind of get a gauge of where we're at. Um, kind of in general, question seven says who pays for free and reduced school lunches? I would throw into that food stamps as well. Who pays for it? Taxes. Is that simple? Question. It's not that simple, but. The government? What part of the government? And where they can pull it around. The farm bill. Hmm. A larger portion, for most, and we'll, we'll learn some of the specifics, but a larger portion of the farm bill goes towards nutritional programs, which includes free and reduced lunch food assistant programs, what have you. Very large portion of it. And it's oftentimes administered through the USDA. So very connected to agriculture, if we want it to be. Um, question eight, do y'all know the difference between those four things? A food bank, food pantry, soup kitchen, emergency shelter. Oh, Take a stab at it. Is it the food bank where like grocery stores or like whoever is partnered with the food bank sends the food and then the food bank distributes out to food pantries? Yes. And then the food pantry distributes, trickles down to soup kitchens? Yes. So soup kitchens are oftentimes more, I say, communal based, but things like nonprofits or churches or things like that that are providing a meal to people. The food pantry is oftentimes that local. Do y'all know what our local food pantry is in Stillwater? The daily bread. Our daily bread. Our daily bread. That is a food pantry who receives food from the Tulsa Food Bank. The Tulsa Food Bank distributes to this area. There's the Oklahoma City Food Bank distributes to another America area. If you have ever um, donated or heard of the Feeding America program that oftentimes has food pantries, they're overall a food bank. What's an emergency shelter? A shelter for a short period of time. Exactly what it sounds like. You know, oftentimes just these emergency places people can go to and receive meals. Um, number 10, I see the statistic, one in six in the state of Oklahoma, it's four, four in six children are food insecure. What does that mean? What does it mean to be food insecure? They don't know where they're getting their next meal. Don't know where they're getting their next meal. They don't get three meals a day. Don't get three meals a day. They don't get the nutrients they need. They what? They don't get the nutrients they need. Don't get the nutrients they need. That's a kicker. So food insecurity is more than just availability of food. It's availability to nutritious food. Guess what, guys? 25 to 30% of college students are food insecure. Maybe eating three meals a day, but are they good meals? And when I say good, nutritious? No, don't use food. Right? Right there, don't that, no. Okay. And so there's differing degrees on where can people, people can have three meals a day, but if they're eating pizza every meal, that's probably, they're gonna qualify as food insecure. Did y'all know college students can qualify for food assistance? 
If 25 to 30 percent of college students can apply for food assistance, how many do you think do? Five percent. What's the that? Oh, oh, I was going to say less than that. Have any of y'all ever applied? No. 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 Why not? I didn't even know that was like a thing for college kids. Like, yeah, I didn't know about it. Uh -huh. A lot of kids also put it in their meal plan, so I think that's why. Uh -huh. But it's really not. Even with the meal plan, most of the time you can qualify. If you can take out a loan for college, why would you not? And, and a loan is oftentimes a government-funded loan, mm -hmm. right? Then why would students not apply for food stamps while they're in college so that they could have access to more nutritional food? They don't think they need it. They don't think they need it. Not educated. Biggest thing is stigma. Biggest thing is stigma. Really unfortunate. Again, and that's money you don't got to pay back. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. People say, I would never do that. I'm not going to take government money. And then how much in student loans do they owe the government? <laughs> so my question is, why doesn't OSU do a better job of like getting that out there? Because a couple of these, like a couple of them didn't know. So like, why aren't we, as a university, educating to say, hey, it's okay. Like helping with the stigma, but also like educating and being like, hey, like you guys qualify. Whose job would that be? So it, it's interesting you ask that. So do y'all remember Kami Grace, the mm -hmm. master student that's here, she graduated? But this she is what her entire thesis was about. She inter or she handed out a survey to over 500 students on campus, and again her data came back similar to what other people have found. 25 to 30 percent of OSU students are food insecure. Most of them don't even know about, and it's not called food stamps anymore. It's called SNAP. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll start using that lingo. SNAP didn't know that they could even qualify for SNAP benefits, had no idea where to go for it. Most didn't even know there was a food pantry in town that they could go to and didn't have to have like a SNAP card. They could just go, right? And so she actually got to present her data to administrators on campus that were putting together kind of a, and this is all prior to COVID, you know, kind of overshadowing everything. Um, but presenting to them some things of like, here's what OSU needs to do. We have a financial services office, right? That y'all can, or financial aid office, y'all can go to as students to help you with paying for school. We have a registrar's office that helps you with academics. You have advisors. Why is there not part of student services something that's related to community resources? Helping students find affordable housing, helping them find food, Right? Um, why can't it just be an application that everybody fills out as a freshman? Because. And you either qualify or you don't. That would make it a lot easier. Affordable housing and. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. What are you going to say, Sylvia? I mean, uh, most kids, when they're filling out like this paperwork, they're going to be like talking to their parents because I'm sure it's going to be very nosy about like their income, like where they stand socioeconomically, and their parents are going to tell them they don't need that because they're going to have the meal plan. What if it was part of like an orientation class? How many of y'all took like the CASNR orientation class or transfer student class? I think that'd be beneficial. Why not just, I mean, it's kind of like when I enrolled Wilk for school, um, they said, do you need, do you qualify for free or reduced lunch? I said, I don't know. And they said, we'll still fill out the application because what it does is even if I get denied, it still helps them keep track mm -hmm. of how many kids are truly in school that are needing food. And it helps with that percentage. You know, we get these percentages of, well, how many students in the community are on free and reduced lunch? Well, if everyone doesn't fill out that application, the percentage that's reported isn't accurate mm -hmm. because how many people don't complete it but actually need it. So I think my big thing with like schooling systems and like people wanting to like help one another, but like when a kid is like denied his food because like his mom and dad have been struggling and haven't paid his school bill, they give him two slices of bread with cheese and an apple, and that's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, I don't I don't understand why we're doing that either. Like, why are we embarrassing these kids? And every school district has different policies. So I know like here in Stillwater, um, if you're not on free or reduced lunch, 
you can charge to your child's account up to a month if at that point the school will reach out to you and then they will devise a new payment plan mm -hmm. to try to avoid things specifically like that. That's definitely an individual school district thing. Our school districts at home now, everyone gets free lunch because so many people need it. Yeah. That's what's happening here in Stillwater. Every student, so we just started this week, A, B schedule. So the kids are going back two days a week. Mm -hmm. And they're, because of the high amount of food insecurity in the Stillwater community, believe it or not, um, they're just ever, it's part of what the state has chosen to use some of the CARES Act funding for. And so through December, right now, school lunches are completely paid for for all students every day. What are some things you hope to learn about food insecurity this month? And maybe from the pre-assessment, you're like, maybe there's some things I really don't know about that I need to learn about. not just forming an opinion, but uh, informed. Yeah, educated. Informed opinion. Yeah. Um, and there is. There's a lot for us to learn. And I think the best place that we're going to start off learning about it is um, watching the movie that y'all are going to watch on Thursday. I want to show y'all in Canvas what's up there. Um, so here's what I've decided. At first... <laughs> Um, I thought about having y'all watch it tonight or tomorrow night and us coming back into class on Thursday to discuss it. But I also realize a lot of y'all work. And I don't want to put that added pressure on you to now have to kind of quickly figure out how to put into your schedule watching this. So I am going to give y'all, um, we're not going to meet for class together on Thursday. My expectation is that y'all will watch the film and instead of participating in a discussion online, you're not going to have to respond to each other's posts, but I have created a discussion board that you will post three discussion questions based on the film to you. And we will use kind of those group discussion questions to facilitate conversation on Tuesday about the film. Do they, we still don't have. The clicker, yeah. Who's our tall, yeah, prior, thanks. Resident tall person. I can always count on you tall person. I just want to show y'all where everything is as a refresher in Canvas because I've been getting a couple emails. But um, essentially what I want y'all to do is watch the film, post to the discussion thread three discussion questions. Um, if you're the first person to post, you're the winner winner chicken dinner. After that, you want to make sure and read what other people have posted so that we don't duplicate questions. <laughs> All right. Um, and so it will be important that while you're watching the film, you take notes because you'll want those notes in class on Tuesday to refer back to things. But also, I want y'all's discussion questions to be more big picture holistic questions, right? So this film is called um, A Place at the Table. It is a documentary. Do y'all know who Jeff Bridges is? Yeah. Um, so he started um, an organization trying to fight food insecurity in the United States back in the 80s. Something he's very passionate about. And so he made this documentary. He's in it quite a bit. And he goes around to a couple different cities and a couple different towns um, to really show us what food insecurity looks like on the ground. So it, it's, it's really good, I promise. But it's going to make us think of things. And one of the things that's going to talk about and some of the data it presents to us is right now our way of combating food insecurity is we rely heavily on food banks, charities, nonprofits, like just the kindness of people's heart, that generosity to give. And yet the more that we have re depended on that in our current system, the more food insecurity continues to rise. Um, there was one point in our government's history where 
at the highest point that we had federally or government funded programs, we almost saw there's hardly any food insecurity at that point in history. As we've decreased government funding, food insecurity's risen. So it makes us kind of question some of those just like, and I call them kind of altruistic, and they're not bad, but just that like saying if we were just all could be more generous, will that really help solve the problem or not? Or are there, uh, are there other systematic things going on that are contributing to it? So I think y'all will really enjoy watching it. Um, and that's why I think it's going to be really important that y'all take notes because it's going to throw some stuff at you and you're going to be like, I need to remember that point, what have you. So um, when we go to the October module in Canvas, if y'all will remember, this very first link is a page for the month. And so I have listed here for y'all what we are doing every single day this month. So for Thursday, no class, you're going to watch a place, a place at the table from home. Here's a little trailer of it. No. <laughs> and show me an ad, YouTube, please. interesting yeah I think y'all will enjoy it so I put here the links there's a link to Amazon and a link to YouTube where you can go rent it like I said it's $2.99 um, if any of y'all are hanging out with each other between now and then why not have one person rent it and y'all split the costs you could do something like that but then here's a link to the discussion board for it so you can click on that link there it'll take you to that assignment to where you post your discussion questions. I would prefer that you have them posted by Thursday night. Um, and so that way I can prep for class on Tuesday. So any questions at all about what y'all need to do Thursday and for class next Tuesday. Another thing, again, go back to that page and you can refer to your syllabus on this too. There are some parts in Food Radical that I would like for y'all to read as you prepare for class next week. So make sure you're kind of reading those parts as well. And so I'll go back to the page to show y'all that. So if you look at Tuesday, just kind of start reading back about some of those thoughts. Pre-assessment, turn those in to Susie and I on y'all's way out and I'll see y'all in class next Tuesday.
I can get more food. Well, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. See ya. See ya.